Hey everybody, we are Francis, Martin, and Robert, and this is Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Welcome back to Snakes and Otters. This is episode 44. I'm Francis in the captain's chair. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. Oh boys, we have got a great one for you all tonight. I've been waiting to do this for some time. It's the pop- grin on his face is incredible. That's right. <laughs> and it uh, isn't Star Trek. And it isn't Star Trek, that's correct. It's a pop culture episode, yes. Uh, but it's one uh, in particular that's been a favorite of mine since 1979. And that is Bond, James Bond. That's what, uh, although that was your, you, Martin, you're the one that suggested that for the title. It is so apropos. Yeah. It's so perfect. What else would you title? Well, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's I have been a Bond aficionado since I first saw the movie Moonraker with a friend that we both know. We went to saw them uh, together. I didn't even know who James Bond was before that. I remember watching that on television, actually. Yeah. And in the in the set in the late seventies, early eighties, ABC got the rights to the reruns, and they would run every Bond movie. About once a month. That's how I was able to catch myself up. It was a big deal yes. uh, before cable television. The yes, it Sunday was. Sunday night movies, ABC had the rights for years in the 70s mm-hmm. uh, to run them. And yeah, oh man, my folks were huge for Bond. And we watched all the Bonds on TV. We would go see them at the uh, theater. So I think I even predate you on the Bond there. Oh, perhaps. Uh, but it became a bit of an obsession with me. In fact, I've got laid out here on my... You're not going to use every one of these, right? No, I've okay. got every one of my... They're not all first editions, but they're all early printings of every James Bond book written by Fleming. And that's just what I grabbed. I've got all the other ones downstairs that were written by authors afterwards. John Gardner in particular some of my favorites. But I really got into this. Uh, I was hooked. Ironically... That first movie, which I do love, Moonraker in 79, was Roger Moore. He's not my favorite Bond at all. And Moonraker is one of the weakest, in my opinion. It is, and yet that's the the door I walked in on. But it was bloody well fun, especially for a 14-year-old at that time uh, with Miss Holly Goodhead. uh, (laughs) One of those inspired names that that, that Fleming started in this book right here. Would never fly today. That's right. Uh, This book right here, Goldfinger, this is a first edition right here. I've got a a paperback printing of it in the United States. Uh, Pussy Galore, the character in that book, yep, she's in there. Uh, He created that name, and that's kind of where it all started. Uh, And... I made it my mission, so to speak, to retroactively go back and get all everything I could on Bond. I've got many, many books on him. He's been a... I really just enjoy the genre, the spy novel. We talked a little bit about yeah. this in the show prep. Ian Fleming, with this book right here, Casino Royale, holding my little hands here, from 1953, single-handedly created a full genre. Nobody had ever done a spy novel before. Nobody ever thought to do one. It was Fleming with this book here, uh, which he eventually sold the rights, film rights to separately because he was broke and he needed some money. So that's why, we'll get into that in a second, why that movie has had a Yeah, the first version was horrible. Correct. Because the rights were owned by somebody else and they could not really compete against uh, the Eon Productions folks who were making the movies at the time. Yeah, so let, let's, let's, let's yes, do that. Let's, let's get that. a little background. Um, just for those that don't understand all this part is... Oh, it's a fascinating history. Yeah, Ian Fleming begins these, and they are spy novels, and again, he predates Graham Greene and Tom Clancy and Clive Cussler and Brad Thor and all these other <laughs> All these people. guys, All yeah. these books that we, this genre that we take for granted today, it started with this one little book, and as well, you can see here, it's not very big. And he's writing from experience, Correct, too. because of his time in the... Uh, in the British intelligence services. Right. Yeah. So, so this is not just him blowing smoke up everybody's rear end. No, he has a Making stuff up. Yeah. This is good stuff. But right. He, he sells rights a couple of different times. There are a couple of different versions of Casino Royale. I think one has David Niven in it. That's right. In, in 67. But that's, uh, <coughs> that it, the rights eventually came back and Eon, Eon Productions yes. eventually but purchased them back. When we think Bond films... That's what we're talking about is the Harry yeah. Saltzman and Albert Broccoli. Albert Broccoli. Eventually. Cubby Broccoli. Yeah. Eventually Barbara Broccoli, which is the same company. Yeah. They, they've they always had the rights to yeah, all these. Yeah, that's the Eon Productions. With a couple of exceptions. Uh, right. Like I said, Casino Royale got sold off early, uh, and it was made into a spoof movie in 67. And Thunderball uh, was actually written, co-written for a TV series. 
with Fleming, uh, Richard Whittingham, and um, Kevin, Kevin McClory. McClory. That's right. And McClory sued Fleming when he put out the book because the movie never, the TV series never happened. And Fleming went ahead and wrote the book uh, in '61, and he got sued because yeah. he didn't write the whole thing. And that's why Eon Productions had to list McClory as an executive producer. Well, that was a deal they made. Yeah, because and, it was and a great story. McClory remit. Oh, pardon me. Remade Thunderball into Never Say Never Again That's right, because he still had the rights he still to that. Had some rights to because it. he had he had co-written that screenplay that eventually came that. But most of the rest of these are all Fleming, and yeah. he would write one of the. It was basically one book a year through the fifties, uh, and these are all titles that we know because they were all eventually made into uh, into movies. One of the things that really got the movies made, because think about it. These are just books at the time in the late 50s. But President Kennedy named From Russia With Love as one of his favorite books. <laughs> yeah. And this went viral. This is before when was the, the first movie made. made it? Uh, the movie, first movie was made in 62. Okay. So Kennedy had done had named this. I don't think you can say it went viral back then. Well, that's correct. Well, I sure am. Uh, <laughs> it was memory. well known that Kennedy <clears throat> loved these books. That is correct. And, and that's that, that movie. He's what we would now call an influencer. Yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, it, the, the deals were trying to be made around that time. That only helped. But finally, uh, Cubby Broccoli and Albert Saltzman, uh, Re- Harry Saltzman, realized that there's a potentiality here. And they were able to get the financing for the first movie, Dr. No, uh, which was like the it was like the sixth book they, that had been written. Yes. Fleming is still writing at this time. He doesn't yes. die until like four years later. So there's still he's actually writing some of the later books while the movies are being made. Yeah. Uh, and they cast an unknown Scottish actor by the name of Sean Connery, which was not actually easily done because he was unknown. Uh, but well, he's not entirely unknown. Yeah, he had done a few things. He'd done yeah. Darby O'Gill and the Little People uh, for Disney and a couple of other things, but he'd not really starred in much at Wasn't, this point. Was he? Was Longest Day before Bond or after? Oh, it was after. After, after. okay. Oh, That's yes. right. Yeah, he was He was pretty much... A, he I wasn't sure because it's one of those black and white still. Right. Uh, he it, it made him a star, of course, because the movie, the movie took off unbelievably. It was well-received in 62. Uh, so much so that they went right into the next one from Russia with Love in '63, mm-hmm. uh, which was with Robert Shaw, along with Sean Connery. That's if you asked me my favorite Bond movie, it would be from Russia with from Love. From Russia with Love is one of the strongest of the it films. Is. It, it really is. It, 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 and these early, really good. These early movies are pretty close, full-on adaptations. Of the yes, books the themselves. The first five or six are pretty close to. It's not until a little bit later. You that only live twice of, goes off the rails. Yeah, they kind of abandon what's really in the books to make new stories and they had, cobble together pieces. They of, had to. Uh, you only live twice in '67. The book had only been written a few years before that, and it really was. It was a travel log more than anything else about Japan with Bond kind of built into it. It really was the first half of it's all about let's go visit Japan and find out all about it. There's some of that in the movie, but they realized this is not very much action, not much action there. Yeah. So they figured we got to come up with something different, and that's kind of where they, from there went on. And of course, it was the one by that time Sean Connery has done five in six years, and he's basically saying, you know, I'm done. You know, I'm sorry, I don't want to do this anymore. So they have to figure something else out because with Goldfinger in '64, the genre explodes. It is of a national phenomenon. Everybody is doing spy novels. Everybody is doing the copycat spy novels that came out in the sixties. Uh, well, and spy, spy television shows. That's correct. I guess the Avengers and uh, I Spy, I the, Man Spy the Man from Uncle, the Man from Uncle, the Prisoners, even one. That's yeah, right. I mean, uh, it it all. became a national phenomenon in the late. The 60s. intelligence community becomes very. Much a phenomenon, a cultural thing that people want which to I'm sure explore. just made them extremely happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but you're right. And it's Bond there, that did that. There's a formula to Bond that's appealing. Uh, there's action. Mm-hmm. There's uh, a charismatic character at the center. Right. There's uh, interesting women. That's <laughs> right. That's well put. Uh, in many respects, it's the Western story uh, translated to modern times. And with a heavy, heavy dose of sexuality dumped into it. That's one of the things that this mm-hmm. was different with this, is these movies 
they were not ashamed of their sexuality. Mm-hmm. I mean, because I, don't know that I agree so much about the Western part of it. I think this is it's still an adventure story. It's an adventure story. It's it's in many ways it has classic elements of of the hero's journey. It's just not a fantastical. Right. Mostly that's where we associate hero's journey, and not every Western is that. But you know, you have definitely a a the different main difference between. Um, spy movies thrillers like uh, like james bond is that he's not a reluctant hero well that's correct he's a man on a mission that's correct and that is the big difference well it also saves a whole lot of time because when you've got a reoccurring it, it's also the longest running movie series of all time it has more sequels than anything else no other movie series has ever come close. Wait, Disney's got Star Wars, so you know. Give it time. Yeah. Give it time, perhaps. And if you count the entire Marvel universe as a sequel to Iron Man, which you conceivably could, they may overtake them. Perhaps they got, but nevertheless. Yeah, yeah, I get your point. You know, it's, and you're it's right. Still, you're right. It's still a, it's how still many? A big how many Bond movies have there been? There have been twenty. Uh, Four, I believe. Oh, Twenty-four yeah. official Eon Productions. That is correct, and you can add two others to that. You can add the Casino Royale from '67 and Never Say Never Again. Uh, that that were done off book, oh, so to speak. Oh. And that would be like counting the Andrew Garfield movies, Spider Man. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, so there's been 22 Marvel movies. Yeah. So they're not that far away. Yeah. They will surpass. Most likely, that's true. That's true because which is more. think about that. That's in ten years. That's a phenomenal thing. Well, that's right because it took since 1962, <laughs> right, uh, to get to where we're at. Uh, and of course, you know they were making them, you know, almost like piecework at first. Actually, you know, there was a while where there were very few being made. There was certainly not one every year. Uh, it, there were several years where yeah. there were no bond, and there was some. Some good sized gaps when there were tra- when there were transitions, especially especially yes, and that's and that's another thing that I think that is so fascinating about Bond, is that he has been so adaptable of a character and of a genre and of a a system for the storytelling that it's been able to reinvent itself periodically. Well, to, they to learned a lesson from Doctor Who. That's correct. You can change the actor, <laughs> change the actor, and you just kind of just go with it. And each actor. And it reflects the time yes. that he's been. Yeah. Because, uh, and, and we've all got our favorites. You know, if you, like I say, Sean Connery and Daniel Craig are, are my favorites. I like them both yes. almost equally. Uh, Sean Connery, hands down for me, nobody else. It, it is. Mostly because a lot of the stuff that he does, that's pure Fleming. And Fleming, I mean, I, I've read On a Majesty's Secret Service five times. Because that was the first book I was I found in my grandmother's closet, actually, before I could get my hands on the others. That's all I had. This was around 1980, 81. And it was amazing. It's still well, one of the best books. The thing about the early uh, books and movies, uh, especially when you compare it to Roger Moore, era of James Bond, is that, and this is just so Sean Connery, is that he's a man's man. Yes, uh, in a way that younger listeners may have a hard time understanding what that means without thinking, well, that's tax- toxic masculinity. No, that's not that's not what we mean. But the the stories were really more about him overcoming the obstacles. Right. Whereas with Roger Moore, there was gadgets and tricks and uh, stuff. Absurdity at times. And absurdity at times. But Moonraker was... is a great example of yeah. that. Uh, a space shuttle being fl- flown overseas, they fire off the engine's and tear away from the plane. It doesn't crash both of them. And it has the, the, the fuel and the ability to fly somewhere. It's a freaking glider in, in, you know, That's right. in the atmosphere. It's highly influenced by Star Wars. Because yes. There's a big laser space battle with space marines at the end. That's right. Yes. Which it is yeah, and, which the is, height of silliness. That's correct. And it, it was an attempt to recapture uh, what was done well, say, at Thunderball. And with uh, You Only Live Twice, yes. where you've got these huge yeah. set-piece battles at the end. They realize, well, people like that. They show up for that. They expect that. Yeah, well, the, the, when there's a lot of, when there's a lot at stake, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that makes a great story. Right. Um, and a lot at stake can either be, you know, a life or death situation for the hero, mm-hmm. or it can have, be something bigger, like the entire universe for Avengers Endgame. Yeah. You know, people want to see something big. It has to be have a huge impact. Yeah, you, you can uh, start with those smaller, yeah. more personal stories, and maybe that's why I like them so much, with Dr. No and From Russia With Love, Goldfinger. They're very a personal story with Bond versus an antagonist. And a, there's a, bit of a definite 
evil villain. Correct. And that's a great thing. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, Get Smart is a great uh, farce of mm-hmm. a comedy show. Which grew out of this. Grew out of this. And one of the things that, you know, it very much parodied Bond. And that's who uh, uh, Maxwell Smart uh, was supposed to be. But, you know, one of the interesting things was they didn't have that recur. you know, they didn't have a single villain. They had that organization. Chaos. Yeah. Chaos. Uh, you know, that's one of the ways that stories like this break down mm-hmm. is when you have to have a good villain mm-hmm. because your villain helps define your hero because the struggle against the villain is what makes the hero a hero. Struggling against, a, you know, a generic organization doesn't work. That's why mm-hmm. some things don't work as thrillers because you don't get the sense that there's something personal at stake. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the reasons Goldfinger was kind of the real launching point because it was the first movie that made a really, really good villain who is in the whole movie as an antagonist from the very beginning all the way through. Whereas <coughs> Dr. No is only in the last maybe quarter of the movie that you see. For Marshall with Love, uh, the character of Grant the Strangler, there's only a brief period on the train where they're actually against each other. Goldfinger is totally different from that. And that's why it became... Such an amazing moment because it was easily captures the imagination of people. So much so that it's not long after that, it's two movies later, where they introduce the character of Blofeld, which becomes it becomes so much of a caricature that Austin Powers mimics him mm-hmm. uh, in, in later Dr. on. Doctor Evil. Doctor Evil. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so ironically, I'll give you a little bit of a trivia here. The scar that Donald Pleasance has on his face in the movie you only know twice is almost directly replicated by the character of Blofeld at the end of the newest, most recent Bond movie, Spectre. He gets his face scarred. And if you look closely, if you're a fan like I am, you notice that's an almost a direct replica. So, obviously you have a ton of enthusiasm. Yes, I have. Which is a great thing. Uh, So, you've talked quite a bit about uh, what you love about this. So, what, I don't okay. mean that sarcastically. Yes. I mean, why is Bond important? Bond. That's where I think you wanted to go. That's Sorry to go. take the captain question from you, but we were getting kind of hung up in why Bond is great. Well, that's individually. That's correct. Uh, mm. and one of the things that I think is the reason that Bond deserves a little bit of study is a he began a genre that is still with us. That's very unique. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has culture. It is a cultural reflection of the times that he's in. It's very Cold War oriented, at well, least initially, yes. uh, and had to be reinvented after that. But but he's also been with us as like you could call him background information since '62. Mm-hmm. He's continually been reinvented for new generations over and over again. And that's something most things can't possibly manage to sustain. But he does. Mm-hmm. And does it well most of the time, not always. Yeah. And we could perhaps talk a little bit about that. Well, and, you know, for me, the hallmark of the character is not the gadgets or the adventures, it's. The character must complete the mission at any cost. And that is very much a hallmark of modern thrillers. Yes. It is. Yes, it's very um, mission-oriented. It's, and, and I think you mentioned Connery kind of being number one, and, and Daniel Craig kind of is that portrayal as a number two. Yeah. I think for those two actors, the reason they're so attractive to me and they're interpretations of this character is that quality comes out the most for the two of them. That's right. You never felt like Roger Moore would grind up whoever it took to grind up to accomplish the mission. No, he's... He's, he's too much of a gentleman. He, he's very much of a gentleman. He, and, he's and got a quip. He's got a, a funny line on all the yeah. time. And, and certainly there's a... I like uh, Live and Let Die. Mm-hmm. I it like probably, Man with the Golden Gun. Yeah. I like those two Roger Moores. But, to me, not only did he play the character too long, he didn't play it with enough of an edge. Oh, that's correct. And, and the reason I like Connery and Craig is this 
determination to complete the mission no matter what it costs. Mm-hmm. Um, it, you know, there's there's a line in Casino Royale, the film Daniel Craig, Vesper Lynn. I'm not getting it exactly right, but basically she says, MI6 looks for maladjusted SAS types with easy smiles and no care of who gets killed along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not that's pretty close to Vesper's pretty close line. To and to me that's kind of the linchpin of the whole series is that and that's really the first time another character has ever stated it that's in right. one of the films mm-hmm. is you know, I'm not going to play your game, Bond, because I'm not going to be just another person that you grind up for queen and country. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a, a great call out because as I'm sitting here thinking about um, the successors, the children of Bond, mm-hmm. uh, which would be uh, the, uh, the the Brad Thors, the uh, the Robert Ludlums, uh, Vince Flynn, Vince Flynn, yeah, uh, those uh, th- those are the more modern ones, but uh, uh, the uh, you know there's so many others. Uh, that especially uh, for the Brad Thor and the, the Vince Flynn, because uh, those are the two I've actually read just about everything they've they've written for their particular characters. And what you just said about the mission at all costs, that is what defines the two main characters uh, in both of those series. Uh, Scott Harbath for Brad Thor, and I'm, honestly, I'm blanking on the Vince Flynn. What is... Mitch I, Rapp. Okay, Mitch yeah, Rapp. I don't know what we're um, <clears throat> And they're very similar guys. You could almost take... Uh, the names and swap them out. <laughs> That's how similar they are. And I'm willing to bet that if you look at uh, most of the thrillers, the main characters are going to be very similar. It's like the uh, post apocalyptic uh, uh, thrillers, uh, another jo- subgenre of this. You know, 95% of them are, uh, you know, ex special forces of some kind, whether it be Navy SEAL, Green Beret, or whatever, uh, that, you know, expect the end of the world and they go home to, to you know, some place and they ford up and they wait for it to come. They, you know, that's the, the setup and that's all you need to know about the setup because mm-hmm. they're yeah. that similar. Um, but a good writer, uh, had, had, like these guys, whether it be Ian Fleming yeah. or. And he, and he was, uh, yes. Uh, the Brad Thors and the, the Vince Flynn's and, and the other Robert Lothams and the others, uh, they managed to bring out uh, a bit of suspense. Because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, your, your main character is going to survive. Primarily because it's a freaking cash cow. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, you don't yeah. really... Although the last Brad Thor, uh, theoretically, could end the series. Uh, partially it's because there's been so many, the character has aged. And so after a certain age, you know, you can't really keep doing this. Uh, but... It's very rare that that happens. You know, usually they keep going because you know that's going to happen. But you never know about everybody else around him. Well, yeah, Fleming wrote fourteen books. Right, and how many books since then? Oh, uh, probably two dozen. Right. Uh, you know, I, I read a fan theory that uh, that the reason that James Bond looks so different in, in all the movies is because James Bond is not his real name. Double O Seven is an alias that is given out <laughs> yeah, for the top operative. Yeah. And that's that's been, which is an interesting fan theory. It is. Uh, it, it doesn't really. Fit. It's a little bit. Of, it's a little bit of that little reach. Bit of a reach yeah, you know, right. Yeah, Bond has just, a specific backstory. He does. Yes. Uh, it's rare that it's come out. It's only with uh, his, Skyfall most recently. Yeah, his they decided to do that. Father is Scottish. His uh-huh. mother is Swiss. Right. They are both killed in a climbing accident. Uh huh. That's kind of. That, that that comes up every so often, but that's, Bond's an orphan. That's not in any. Of, that's not Fleming. Uh, a lot of these books and mo- I mean a lot of these movies steal uh, much from Fleming's work. Uh, Casino Royale was that with Daniel Craig was a modern adaptation, but it is almost identical to the actual book. Yeah, the characters, the events, and everything like that. Uh, it it I, I was delighted to see it because it had never been done, uh, and I thought that you know it's kind of a waste of, of good Fleming material. They finally were able to do that. Yeah, it took them what three tries. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, exactly, and it. Uh, it so they finally got it where it was, and it was well done. Mm-hmm. But it's that mission, that sense of mission. You're exactly right. That's not. It, it's a. It's a bigger mission. Before Fleming wrote Casino Royale, what you had were detective thrillers, cop thrillers. Yeah, that sort of type of a thing. Right. It wasn't. You didn't have anything like this. Yeah, that's and that's one of the things I think is the most uh, interesting about because I never really thought about it before until we discussed where we were going to take this in the yeah. show prep. You know, the uh, uh, 
prior to this, all of your conflict was far more personal. Mm -hmm. There was very rarely, uh, except in war movies, right. uh, national conflict. Right. right, And that was a different type anyway. And that was a different type, because uh, that was direct combat. This is far more subtle. It is because it's the Cold War. Right. And it is very much, as you said, a product of the Cold War. It is very much an East versus West. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, and that's uh, the early days of the early books of Fleming, uh, up until his first six or eight, it's him versus the Soviets. Right. Now, we don't get that later on. because No, because by the time 62 comes around, they've, they've taken his later creation of Spectre, this multinational boogeyman organization, and they've retrofitted into these older books. Right. If you were to read Doctor No, if you were to read, especially from Russia with Love, it is a bit against Smirsch. Against Smirsch. The, it's yeah. the, the, the predecessor to the KGB. The, the KGB's hit squad is That's exactly Smirsch. it. Right. Yeah. So, which in a way is good because it makes it more timeless. That's uh, right. In, in many ways. And that's, and that's one of the reasons that uh, they like to do that because it was easier to sell overseas. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, uh, but, it's less provocative. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Um, but this idea, though, that... Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, there have been spies since, you know, Thermopylae. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? absolutely. I mean, this is not anything new. Uh, and while I'm sure there were probably uh, some stories somewhere that dealt with spies, mm -hmm. nothing like this because this is because of the context where for really 40 years, mm -hmm. uh, you know, up through the fall of the Soviet Union, the specter of, no pun intended, yeah, uh, you know, global nuclear war mm -hmm. and the end of all civilization, uh, that was a very real thing. That is something that's hard for even us to grasp because, you know, for us it wasn't as uh, prevalent. I mean, it was there in the background, but yeah. it, it wasn't nearly what, uh, you know, our, well, for me, older brother and sister might have experienced. You guys, are, that would not be the case because you're the oldest. Um, but, you know, this idea that... Uh, uh, the stakes are much higher, mm -hmm. is new. And you see that in these new uh, thrillers. Oh, yes. You know, uh, like I said, I, I only, I'm only using the Brad Thor as an example because I've just finished reading the last of the Brad Thor. I binge, re I binge read. Some people binge watch. <laughs> I binge read. Yeah. Uh, actually, I do both. And, uh, you know, f it starts out where he is fighting Muslim terrorists for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, although he does throw in several Russian uh, because, you know, now Russia has reappeared as a U.S. rival. You know, rival, say yeah. Foe. Enemy, exactly. But they're not exactly friends. Right, yeah. Competitive. Um, <clears throat> yeah. And so taking on that, uh, that, that global outlook, you know, what, you know, not just what's the current conflict, because every one of these books is going to be, you know, you look at Hunt for Red October, it is obviously mm -hmm. a product of the end of the Cold War. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's but it's very exactly overt. the same kind of book we're talking about. That's it, correct. Yeah, it's, it it's a, East versus West, yeah. and it, it which is distilled down into people uh, that are committed to their understanding of this is the way things are. Yep, and we are clearly in the right; they are clearly in the wrong. Which, I, if you think about it from a story perspective, saves you a whole lot of work. Well, if you don't have that from a story perspective, your story is not very interesting. Right, you'd have to create it. Yeah. Which gives you a lot more work to do. This this kind of builds upon that, uh, and it and it really the movies themselves in particular uh, would try to gravitate there. The problem is, I think, with the movies and Moonraker is a great example. They kind of reached the apex of silliness there, mm -hmm. yeah. and they realized uh, because the next movie after that you might remember for your eyes only. I love for your eyes only. It's a complete reset. That's right. Back to kind of a regular thing. I got a it was Russians. A, it's a competition. It was a serious attempt to be a, to do a serious bond, and then yeah. and, and Roger Moore did fine with that. Yeah, it, he was capable of it. It's just they decided maybe we've gone too far, and they tried to bring it back, but Moore was done. I mean, he had two more movies he did after that uh, that were not all that good: Octopussy and A View to a Kill, and then they decided, well, let's try again. And then they did Timothy Dalton, which was meh. Well, don't forget, uh, Sean Connery had one in there uh, around the same. Because, as a matter of fact, we had two competing Bond movies yes. out at the same in time. 1983, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the Never Say Never Again. Which was a Kevin McClory remake of yes. Thunderball, Everybody basically. You know, it's, it's interesting to talk about the, the two Timothy Dalton films. I did like the first one. I the did. Living Daylight. I didn't like it. I didn't dislike it. It was a, it was a deliberate attempt to to change Bond in particular because he has only one love interest. 
a lot of the by this time it got a lot of critic criti criticism back saying you are just a womanizer that will screw anything you can get your hands on. Yeah. And that's not really and very some fair. Of the, some of the uh, Connery movies, there was only one. Well, well, that it, became kind of a thing with the more. It, it, it came to later. Girl to girl that's girl. correct, yes. But uh, I consider the next one one of the weaker ones. The, um, the Living to, uh, License, License to Kill. Kill. Right, yeah. And I guess this is just a, a personal thing, but... I. David Hedison ruins that movie for me. <laughs> You've said that before. You do not like him. He's the only person uh, until recently to place the character, the supporting character, Felix Leiter, twice. Yeah, more, yeah. Uh, who currently uh, plays? Jeffrey Wright. Jeffrey Wright. Now, he's doing a he's phenomenal, fan, fan, job. phenomenal job. He's phenomenal job. He's supposed to be one of the major, more, more, more major characters in this next Bond movie that's about to drop in April, No Time to Die. Yeah. And Jeffrey Wright's a very good actor. Yeah. Mm. And they're allowing him to actually grow with this... Uh, the the character of Felix Leiter is actually kind of his a reoccurring friend who's never played by the same person in all. I mean, he's like in the first five movies, and he's in it completely somebody else. Yeah, uh, Jack Lord was good. Jack Lord, but well, none of them were bad. Yeah, uh, Jack Lord played him in Doctor No. Uh, uh, I forget. I, I forget who played him in uh, in Goldfinger. He was in Goldfinger. Yeah, it's a good character in Goldfinger. Uh, Rick Van Nutter played him in Thunderball. Thunderball, which yeah. is very good. Norman Burton plays him in Diamonds Are Forever. And uh, then we get him again, I think. Um, I don't think he comes back again until Live and Let Die, until which is David Hedison. And so, he comes back again as him in yeah. License to Kill. Yeah, and I guess it's just the thing. Uh, I don't like David Hedison's portrayal of Felix Leiter. So it kind of derails yeah. uh, the Living, uh, not Living Daylights, uh, License, License to, to kill. kill for me. However, License to Kill does have one of my favorite Bond girls in Carrie Lowell. Yes, yes. Terrific portrayal. It's Really fun uh, part that yeah. she played, and it's it's not Timothy Dalton's <clears throat> fault by any way. Because I think he was a fine and adequate Bond, but I think you, you know what he was were... he was not everybody's first choice at the time. That's right. That's when everybody wanted Pierce Brosnan. That's right. But he didn't he, come until later. He wouldn't. That's right because he was he couldn't get out of his uh, Remington Steel contract. And, and actually, I, I think it's good that he didn't do it then because Remington Steel wasn't serious enough to make the jump to. Uh, that it, that is correct, and he, he was he, much better as Bond than I thought he was going. Because I mean, everybody wanted him because it seemed like he'd be the perfect guy. But there was that nagging doubt because of the Remington Steel character, right? Well, they needed it needed rest, and they yeah. did. They they let it rest for uh, a few extra years between uh, the last Dalton. And License to Kill is what eighty nine, eighty nine. That's correct. And Goldeneye is not till ninety three. Oh, I thought it was ninety five. Uh, you might be right. I, you might I be right. Seems like there is a quite a large. It, yeah, yeah. Like, it's like Brosnan and his Bond, but I, I do think that it, it doesn't have the same. It was a edge. continuation. It was attempt to kind of do the same thing we've done before. Yeah. Uh, although uh, Dame Judi Dench did a great job as M in that. Uh, yeah. That was a uh, something that had been criticized widely at the time uh, for putting a female in that position. But it, but when you have somebody like her. Uh, they did it well. But you know, you say criticize or, or uh, panned or how, I forget what the word you use shows where my mind is already uh, about doing what we've already done before. But realistically, that's what all of these books are doing. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, you can't, I don't know that you can call something out for doing, trying to do the same, something we've already done before, unless you're just repeating the same book multiple times, right. Casino Royale. Of course, granted, that was an attempt to get it right. So, yeah, yeah it, it, you can't really. Well, count it there are before. some of the Brosnan stories feel very lifted from Connery stories. Well, that's correct because, well, I mean, if you want to talk about a direct lift, you only live twice, and the Spy Who Loved Me are almost identical in plot. I've seen some analyses of that. It is actually kind of scary. Well, well, and so is the what's the later one with Brosnan uh, with Halle Berry? Oh, Die Another Day. It's that, that's another laser beam in space one, just like the other Diamonds are Forever. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that that one has been considered the one that almost killed the franchise. Yeah, Diamond it, it's day. a very last. I wish, honestly, I, I don't understand because if Moonraker can't kill it, I don't know what can. It was a different time then. And I know, but <laughs> they're still making that. They were still making that same type of '90s movie, and they realized it just doesn't work. Well, they had to reinvent it, which they did. I, is it reinventing or is it going back to basics? Because both. Because I mean, like I said, well, I don't think it can be both exactly, except you have a new actor in Daniel Craig. Oh yeah, but it was. But you know, stories were very different. Well, in particulars, yes, but I mean, the the spy thriller. If you read 
Now, granted, movies can be a lot different because you're going to get all the visuals that go with it. You right. know, more explosions or less explosions, hotter women or less hot women, you know, whatever. Because, you know, those are two big things that you're going to see in a Bond movie. But for the most part, all of these spy thrillers, they're the same story. They were very, they became very formulaic. And I don't mean just the Ian Fleming, James Bond. I mean all of them. Mm -hmm. They really are. But that's okay because the particulars are what make them different. Variations on a theme, yes. You know, so I am far more forgiving, and I don't think it's fair to criticize things like you know, having the same plot. Now, if you take the exact same script and you just give it to different people, now you are going to get a different movie because people will play them the same script differently. Right. That's fair. But, uh, and, and certainly plot point for plot point, that's a fair criticism. But for the most part, these are all the same stories. But they're still fun. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they are fun, that they're enjoyable, you know, maybe early on it was because it's good versus evil and good wins and there's some eye candy along the way. And that goes both for men and women because you know Sean Connery takes his shirt off a number of times. He does, yes, correct. And that was no small thing for uh, some of them. But you know what's interesting? Compare him to the uh, to the uh, Bonds today or some of the other action stars. He looks like a freaking wimp compared to them. It just shows you how different. Well, yeah, uh, if you look at Daniel Craig, he is incredibly he's buff. Cut. Yeah. yeah, he is cut. Yes, yeah, right. Uh, you know Sean Connery, not so much. It's more natural. Yeah, yeah. And you know Roger Moore, definitely not. Yeah. I mean, there's not there's not one, you know just one uh, more Bond movie where he's a little pudgy. Yeah, especially you know? the last couple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, I, I, like I said, I just don't know that it's entirely fair to critique them for similarity of plot because it's a genre that has is only different in the particulars. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, with Casino Royale with Daniel Craig in 2006, it reinvented itself again. And it has been enormously successful. So, in what way did it reinvent itself as opposed to so going, going back, back to, the, to basics? the basics? Well, it did go back... Well, it's almost not a fair question because it's adapting the first book pretty tightly that it was never able to be adapted. So, by, by definition, it's going to go back to basics because it's taking the, the mm -hmm. plot and most of the story beats from that novel. Mm -hmm. But... The modernization that they've done it. This is now a cold, hard, mission-driven individual. Daniel Craig's character is not. He doesn't make quips. He doesn't. Mm -hmm. There's very little humor in these newer movies. These are very serious, uh, intense action thrillers. Whereas even with Pierce Brosnan, there's still a little bit of the Roger Moore quip. You know, I would say that. It is, oh, sorry. I would say that it is not then reinvented. What they have done is they have lifted and taken from the successors to Bond because that is exactly Mitch Rapp, Scott Harvath. Oh, I don't doubt There's that. There's competition. Yeah. Well, that's there correct. is competition. Mission and they have Impossible series, especially. Yes. Oh, great example. Mission that's, Impossible. That's the competition. That and the um, uh, what's the the Jason Bourne series? Oh, Jason Bourne. That's oh, my correct. Gosh. That is right. That's that's yes. the two series that they're reacting to. You got it with Daniel Craig. And, and that's great. It's amping it up into this. Well, they become very serious, and people they realize oh. that people don't want this wise cracking, uh, babe boffing guy that just kind of winks at you and does these things. That's that's gone. Well, and it's not just actually uh, uh, borrowing from the competition. That's your heroes. You know, your heroes nowadays are not are very rarely Captain America aside, true heroes in the traditional sense. They are the anti heroes. You know, the Punisher is the probably the best example from mm -hmm. comics. That guy is not a freaking hero. Right. You know, he's a lunatic. Now, granted, he's a lunatic for very good reasons. Yeah. Uh, that's another story entirely. Mm -hmm. um, but the the flawed hero who has that touch of vengeance. Irony uh, of ironies, in, in many respects, it was uh, James Bond was kind of like the step-grandfather of the Punisher in many ways because the, that spy genre... Gave birth to the men's adventure genre from this time that uh, Don Pendleton created the character of the Executioner in '69, mm -hmm. which was the they the Mac Bolin. Mac Bolin was the that was basically the Punisher was a steal directly from that, and Pendleton never pursued that. He could have, and he probably should have, because it's a different so the Executioner uh, family gunned down in front. Oh, of absolutely, him? it's mm. correct. Uh, it, uh, slightly different, slightly, but, yeah, but similar thing. It was it was done in '69. 
uh, and it and it exploded into the men's adventure genre that stayed there was through the mid through the mid sixties. Through the seventies and through the eighties, it's enormous amounts of novels. Well, there are some some of these, especially the Mac Bolan series, The Executioner, is just him single handedly taking on the mob. It's more the John Wick style, mm-hmm. where there's no suspense to it really, other than, well, how many people is he going to shoot through this that's, whole thing? Well, that's correct. That's right. Um, so I mean, I've got that, actually I've got a, the first hundred and ten of those books behind those books up there. I've read <laughs> most all of them. Yes, uh, they're they're a rousing good time. They were very different. They were kind of given birth by this because. Yeah. I think a lot of it was Fleming realized these books were written for guys. Well, yes. yes. And uh, a lot of people realized that the old uh, mystery thil- thriller, the old detective story, just didn't carry any weight anymore. And that's why you needed something else to re-energize it. And that's why the, the men's adventure genre, subgenre that came out of that, I mean, that's how they categorized them. There were, and there was probably pinnacle books... And these were signet books, and there were there's like six or eight publishing houses in the 60s and 70s and 80s that published these. Now they eventually all went out of business because this oh they were absorbed by others. Some one or the other. Some of the others. Berkeley ended up buying some of them. Uh, Penguin books and all that stuff. But most of them went out of business. They were very independent authors, off, operators with independent uh, piecemeal authors. Uh, some were very successful. Some not. Uh, sci-fi was doing the same thing because they were pub- they were they had a lot of different publications that were put out around this time because the print medium was pretty big for adults. Well, yes. The entertainment choice. This is why movies... Ten Commandments was in theaters for over a year. That's right. Because there weren't 500 channels. That's right. This you was, know, this was how people entertained themselves in the 60s, 70s, right. and 80s. Uh, adults. Uh, in many respects, these are the comic books for the older readers that wanted to read it that way. Uh, they they didn't want to read that level, but that this was this was an adventure escapism. Westerns are the same thing. Western novels are pretty much the same type thing. So Colonel Sun is probably looks like the thickest Bond book ever written, at least out of these originals. It is because it was not actually by Fleming. The reason I pulled it out, ah, okay. it was based on uh, when Fleming died when he was putting together an outline for that book, uh-huh. and Kingsley Amis, uh, who wrote under the name of Robert Markham, actually took that. Uh, outline and wrote that book on it. It was one of the only James Bond books other than Fleming that was published after his death for, for about 20 years before finally the folks that own the copyright says, well, maybe we should find somebody else that can write some. And uh, they went to uh, an author uh, by the name of John Gardner, a British guy, and they commissioned him to write new novels Right around 81, I think it was. I, I, I didn't bring them up, but I got the, uh, most of them down in the basement. They're excellent. He, it was kind of like they, he didn't age him. It was just like we're dropping him in today, and here's where it goes. We don't give a backstory. We don't need to. He's just James Bond. He's here. Everything's in place. Well, that's the nice thing about something like James Bond. That's right. You know, it's, it's like any, anything like this. So I think the Brad Thor thing about aging his, his mm-hmm. uh, uh, main character to the point where he really has to consider... Uh, retiring from the field because it's not realistic for him to be almost 50 years old and taking down uh, terrorist cells. That's right. Yeah, that's... Um, um, you know, it's like in the comics. You know, Superman's been around since 1939 with only a couple of actual reboots right. uh, to account for uh, the passage of time. Uh, Marvel Comics used to say that uh, the, Mar- the age of the Marvel Universe is seven years from the time of the Fantastic Four's first issue. Yeah. Uh, that's been kind of thrown out. Now they, yeah. it's around ten years now, which yeah. is still kind of ridiculous. right because the, uh, and that's kind of the way a lot of these were. Most of these were ageless heroes. Right. You know, they don't ever they'll refer to previous books and previous adventures, but they don't, and they're set at the present time, but they don't account for the passage of time. Right. James Bond is just as active in uh, The Man with the Golden Gun as he was in Casino Royale. Which... So, one of the things that I'm, I'm just fascinated by that you have not done is to bring in the Star Trek connection. With... What? Go ahead. The worst season two episode, I think, at least I think it was season two, they did Casino Royale. They did the episode called, uh, at least I think it was called Casino Royale. Oh, the Royale. The Royale. The Next Generation. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. I did not do that. Yeah, the Royale. The Royale, yes. Yeah, which was basically a, uh, 
the Enterprise goes. It's it's one of the stinker episodes. It is. It's it is absolutely a, true a stinker, stinker episode. It was a second season. Wasn't it was it? second yeah, season. Yeah. That's right. And it was an attempt. They beam down to a planet and get stuck in a bad novel, and they can't get out of it. Right. And they've got the only way they can get out of this, of this constantly replaying story over and over again, is they have to actually end the book. They have to become these. Uh, Deus Ex Machina characters that appear and win and take over, and then they can get out. Ugh. It's awful, and it's got like I say, it's got it a very similar. It might have been good name. if it had been done well, but it was done horribly. Well, and they and they kind of intended it to be a little tough, tongue in cheek because they said and they did. Yes, they said it was a bad novel. Yeah, and but I'm sorry, it's kind of insulting to us viewers. It was definitely not one of the best ones out there. Uh, the first and second season had more than their share of uh, flaming turdy piles. Yes. Uh, here and there, uh, but I mean, it was. But there are some excellent ones in there too. True, but I mean, it was a bit of a spoof on on James Bond. It, yeah, exactly, and uh, and really any bad novel. Not, not to say, but Fleming was actually a good writer. Yeah, uh, it, yeah. It, I'm not saying that Fleming was. I just right. that was. But a lot of what he did spawned some really stinky outtakes uh, because everybody was writing spy novels in the 60s and 70s. Again, it kind of morphed in the 70s into that men's adventure I mentioned where the executioner, which is a Punisher kind of thing, it starts with that. But there's there's a whole host of different stories about that. Pinnacle Books published a dozen of them before they went out of business in the early 80s because they were popular. They were cheap. And the guys that they had writing them could churn them out. But they ain't literary uh, masterpieces, I can tell you. Although some of them, and I've, got, I've read many of them, if not most of them, they're still fun. Don't take them too seriously. I, all entertainment, whether it's something I read or watch, I judge by whether or not I had fun in the moment. That's exactly it. So even though summer stinkers, but many years. Star fun. Trek two thousand nine, the Kelvin timeline. Ah uh, yes. As a Star Trek episode, really stinks. There's some really bad things about it, but it was a fun watch. Exactly. For what it is. Agreed. You know, you cannot take it too serious. You can't really take a lot of it too seriously. Because if you do, you're gonna be really disappointed. Well, and I, that's kind of where I was because I was expecting. Now, I will, there are some exceptions to that, you know. For instance, uh, you know, they're doing a new Indiana Jones movie, uh, fifth it, one. That's fifth one. That's right. It's gonna start filming uh, this summer, I think. Uh, April, actually. Right. Uh, and so now, exactly. one, two, and three are considered to be great movies. Right. They're fun. Nobody likes four. Kingdom no. of the Crystal Skull. Nobody likes that one. Uh, so it's one of those ones where it's just hard to take any kind of enjoyment out. Well, of. a lot of people had a lot of criticism about the second one too, Temple of Doom. In fact, Spielberg eventually apologized for it. Really? Because I, I enjoyed the hell out of it. I, I did. I did. It had its moments. It wasn't as it, it was not as good as the other. Well, two. It, it's certainly, harsher, but it, it's... in today's society and probably even before that, you know, the character of Short Round is horribly offensive. Yeah, he's incredibly racist. Yeah. Well, the character is he, the character. Himself isn't, but the writing of the character that way is, That's right. is so stereotypical. Right. Well, let me circle you back around, though, because we're, we're 48 minutes, so I want to finish up a little bit. But the appeal of Bond, why is it so enduring? I think the adventure story, the hero, the modern hero, versus the opposing side is a timeless story. Mm-hmm. Uh, the agent, and I don't just mean that as a secret agent, but somebody who's who's writing, working for a greater cause against impossible odds, and the fact that it is modern. See, that's the key, that's the key that's so different than. Will these be pointless in a hundred years? No, because they've they've evolved since then. They no no they, no these these because these will not be modern. I mean, they're not terribly modern now. Well, that's oh well yeah well they're Cold War. They were of the time that they were. Well, they were embedded in that time inextricably, whereas many of the other stories before that, like those detective stories, they're, they don't really that doesn't really matter. This is set within a particular time and in a particular world that was real. I think that's what makes them timeless, and that's why they get reinvented every so often yeah. to be relevant for the time yeah. that they're created. Yeah, in. I mean it's an adventure. Mm-hmm. There's a pretty girl. There's you know, a, oh, there's a, a romance of, aspect to yeah, it too. Yeah, a ton of fun stuff. You're, you're putting the, the the adventure story with a romance story together. Yeah, and then that's in the got end, appeal. Like I said, the the where there's the drive to win, no matter the consequences, is is pretty dramatic. It is. Uh, again, you know that 
when it's done well. That whole call out of it in Casino Royale of, you know, you think nothing of who you'd have to sacrifice for queen and country is is an important aspect of these stories all the way through. And the, the more the story or the actor brings that out, mm-hmm. it seems like the stronger the portrayal and the more memorable. Again, everybody's favorite Bond probably is, is Sean Connery. Mm-hmm. Not my wife. She actually likes Roger Moore. Oh, wow. There's no accounting for taste. I did not know Mrs. That. Robert is not as big a fan. Well... But, you know, uh, that is probably the exception. But, but for the, t- Connery's portrayal is, despite all of his worldliness, there's a desperation. Yeah. Well, she only knew Bond. Roger Moore because, you know, she wouldn't have been watching the Sunday Night movies. Mm-hmm. You know, she wouldn't have seen the Sean Connery until much later. Right. So, your first Bond is often your favorite Bond, and Roger Moore's her first Bond. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, yeah, it's it, the, 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 Part of the character that is so driven to succeed and again to sacrifice that comes through strongly in Connery, comes through strongly in Craig, and not as much in the others. Well, I think what I know what you're describing is this. <clears throat> it's what I have said many times, uh, so much that I'm probably a broken record uh, to some of the listeners and maybe even to you guys. Um, it's what you're describing is the core story that every culture has, which is the hero's journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's Now, you don't get all of the elements in something like a Bond, because he is not the reluctant hero. Usually the hero's journey, you know, you think about um, uh, 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 Tolkien and uh, the first book in the trilogy, mm-hmm. and you've got a very reluctant hero. He does <coughs> not want to go on very, this journey. Very reluctant Frodo, yes. Yes, right. he, he does not want to do this. But he knows he has to. Right. He's willing to sacrifice for Shire and whoever's in charge of the Shire. In Middle Earth. Yeah. Middle Earth, yeah. Uh, so, you know, that, and that's very much part and, of it. And yeah, willing to do. it'll be Aragorn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's the sort of thing that um, we all like because it's the kind of sacrifice that's inspiring. Mm-hmm. It's the kind of sacrifice that secretly we all hope we are capable of. Yes, we'd all like to be in that place. Yes. Yeah, we'd we'd like all, to, we would all, guys in particular, would like to be James Bond. Because he's got a lot of stuff together. I'd rather be Captain America. Uh, that's a good one. That's a good call. Because actually, one of these times in these pop culture, we're going to do Captain America. Well, I, and that's going to be my episode. Yeah, absolutely, it should be. Yes. Well, gentlemen, um, one last toast of 1792 bourbon to Bond, James mm-hmm. Bond. That's right. It's not a martini shaken, not stirred, but uh, he, he'll drink anything. Well, uh, Judy Dench is in like bourbon. Mm. She famously, we'll uh, Pierce Brosnan says, your predecessor kept some scotch. And she says, I prefer bourbon. Well, Maybe. she's now my favorite. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, yeah, she's, she's a great. great. She's and great. and we, yeah, we didn't even touch on all the other great actors that have been involved. Oh, you can't. Uh, M, I mean, uh, oh. M was a terrific character. I love Bernard Lee as M. Hmm. Um, a little shout out to all of, all the actresses that have played Money Penny. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's uh, correct. Yeah. So, you know, even yeah. though it's gadget oriented, you know, I love some of the Q stuff. Yeah. yeah. Ironically, that was not Fleming. Fleming didn't have any of that stuff. It was very. It was pretty much very serious with regards to all that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there was a lot of great actresses that went through here and uh, that played uh, the love interests. And I know that that kind of sounds like I'm minimalizing, but I don't mean to because. Uh, Daniela it's Bian- a product of the times. That's right. Daniela Bianchi is uh, uh, is amazing in From Russia with Love. Diana Rigg is amazing in From. Uh, uh, she's uh, amazing in everything. That's right. I mean, uh, she in uh, On a Majesty's Secret Service, which is still one of my very favorites. Uh, she was fantastic in that. And there's so many others that that we that we could name. And know you've all we all kind of have our favorites. Those are two of mine. But uh, so Francis. What's up next? Oh, next time. We're going back to our history side next time. Uh, we, this time around, we talked about the 1972 election. We're going to talk about another dirt, what we call the dirtiest elections in history. This is kind of a reoccurring theme for us that we're going to go back to occasionally. We're going to go back to 1820, uh, John Quincy Adams versus Andrew Jackson. You think our political 
uh, elections today are dirty and awful and terrible, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're yeah. going to show you we've been doing yeah. this all along. Yeah, and I think we're actually going to start with 1800. Uh, because that's, that's really the first thing. It's, it's going to be a little, you know, we're going to bounce around to hear a little bit all that stuff yeah. because we each have our, our, our favorites. Yes. The only reason that. it starts in 1800 and not in 1788 is because nobody was going to be dirty against George Washington. That's correct. He got a pass. But after that, game on. That's right. Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel. Yeah.